I am going to to do everything I can to get you to pay attention, you the gentle viewer, who someday, actually very likely someday, may have to interact with the cancer industry. So I'm going to do a test, first of all, to see if my audio dropout is going to be okay. And second of all, to just see what it's like to get through these difficult words. It's apparent to me that the way Dr. Simoncini wrote this book, it wasn't for, you know, the average lay reader, but I think it's like a shout out to doctors who maybe in the back room will be doing therapies that will be far more effective than the therapies that are allowed by the American Medical Association. So he's talking about baking soda, and he's, he's I mean, I could read the whole book to you. It's absolutely fascinating. But he talks about candida, and he says uh, that nobody saw this connection, and even when they do DNA analysis, you see you're essentially talking about the same thing. And he says, well, why doesn't it look the same? And that could be that the head of the mushroom can look different than, than the roots or the spores. So what's apparent, he said, cancer always has candida with it. But people are thinking in a limited way of what candida is. And he's thinking in a more unlimited way outside the box. It took him years to, uh, to put this together. And he's all, he was also very, very careful about how to introduce it into mainstream because he was an, an MD oncologist. And when he got switched out of cancer therapy, maybe he was doing uh, work on diabetes, he kept this memory in him of what it was like when he was a medical student and they said that nobody knows what causes cancer and he felt that it was kind of like it started something within him I'm going to find out what causes cancer so that's what I call a prayerful attitude when you want something so much and particularly when you're stimulated by the great suffering and it's causing such pain in the heart that you will do anything in order to get the knowledge that you need to address the suffering that you see. So we're about on page 144 of the book at this point, I am, and he's talking about the, the reasoning behind the baking soda treatment. And again, I will stumble through the, uh, the big words. Treatment limitations. I believe that we cannot administer full dosage for cancer patients with severe heart, renal, and hepatic, hepatic, hepatic problems, that means to do with the liver. In any case, however, it is best to try to reach the maximum tolerable quantity, as a dosage that is too low or too thinly distributed over time cannot be effective in depth. In some patients, although not afflicted by other pathological conditions other than a tumor, if there are many masses or the masses have, a large, have large dimensions, we have sometimes observed a remarkable increase in the temperature up to 39 degrees centigrade in the first days of therapy with bicarbonate. So that's what he's using, bicarbonate of soda. Now, um, I'm not sure what 39 degrees is here, but I believe it's a fever, a high fever. And what's notable about cancer is that there is no fever. So it seems as though somehow the body's been fooled and it's not elevating the temperature, which is usually a natural response of the, um, uh, of the defenses in the body to sort of, you know, get rid of the invaders. This is how the fungus is able to sort of creep into the body. This is the effect of the brutal lysis of the colonies. He's talking about cancer as a colony, a, a, a fungi, which in some cases is even responsible for the high amylacusis contents and for transitory renal insufficiency, sometimes associated with a bladder urinary block, which can be solved through catheterization. catheterization. Now this is what is going to separate the doctors from your regular health practitioners that are getting by with uh, a license for, for natural health care. That kind of license will not allow them to put catheters in the body. 
And it seems as though what he's saying here is there's such a die-off through the baking soda of this fungus that as it gets sloughed off, the bladder could get clogged up. And he said that's not a problem. You can just work around it with catheters. Well, you can do that if you're a doctor. But if you're, a, uh, if you're not a doctor, you can't do it. Or if you're a doctor who's had your license taken away, you can't do that either. Okay, so hypertension or hypotension events, as well as episodes of relapsing cephalia. I don't know what that means. I guess I'll look it up. You can do it too. C-E-P-H-A-L-E-A. Complete the picture of side effects, which it is wise to emphasize are rare and brief, that is, without negative after effects. The therapy that is most indicated to counter all the instances described above is the fast intravenous infusion, about one hour of glucose filibose at 5% or 10% solution with an addition of potassium chloride and physiological solutions. I don't know what physiological solutions are. He mentions it later on, too. That are capable of complete resolution, generally, without the utilization of any symptomatic drug, by helping the drains to bring the circulating catabolites, catabolites back to the standard value. The use of antibiotics, antipyretics, diuretics, sedatives, cortisonics, and other drugs should be avoided or extremely limited, except for some particular cases, at least during the treatment with sodium bicarbonate, since any additional toxic element in circulation weakens its antifungal effect. From this point of view as well, natural medicines show an undisputed superiority over official medicines because they at least preserve the organs in a condition that is sufficiently energetic and reactive. So you want to have the body able to react. Uh, vegetal aprotetic vitamin therapies with fasting or other means variously adapted by this or that therapy system and often underestimated are based fundamentally on this principle. That is that a clean organism has a more dynamic circulation and may rely on a more active immune system. In short, it is better to defend itself. It is better able to defend itself. So um, he's he's um, supporting what we call alternative therapies. But later on, you know, he points out that there's some aspects of alternative therapies that are not as rigorous as uh, mainstream therapy. But mainstream therapy is being very negligent in blocking out uh, a lot of the studies or promoting more studies to, uh, to look more deeply into this, the fact that cancer is a fungus. And, you know, instead of creeping around having to write books like this to, to sort of do shout-outs to, to reach other doctors, this is a very interesting book in that it can grab the attention of the lay reader, but there's enough information that if you are a doctor and you don't have access to, say, medical hemp oil, uh, how are you going to make bicarbonate of soda uh, an illegal substance, you know, schedule, whatever it is that we have for the hemp oil? He says, use of an allopathic form formulation is therefore not indicated contrary to what is usually proposed in the treatment of tumors because fungi are able to exploit any element that weakens the tone of the organism and that overloads its metabolism. What is needed is not to delay the attenuate or attenuate the reaction of defense. Conversely, we must accentuate them by avoiding any drug or any food that is too heavy. So essentially what he's saying here a lot of times people are saying, oh, yeah, that's great, natural therapy and, and uh, you know, get your colonics and so on. But when it comes to cancer diagnosis, they just run like crazy for the chemo and radiation because uh, you don't want to waste any time. And so what he points out in other pages really extensively is that the chemo and radiation are chewing up the organs so badly they're essentially, uh, you know, pre-digesting or setting up the condition for these little spider webs of fungus to start to, to go in. And then he'll go on and talk about 
oropharynx cancer, I guess that's stuff in the mouth, and he says how a solution of one and a half teaspoons of baking soda into a glass of water administered twice a day. Now, I'm not sure if you swish it around or spit it out. It goes on for 10 days. The, re the, re the treatment is repeated once a day for another 10 days at the end of this first period. Uh, the treatment's repeated after a week of rest if some small residual neoplasia persists. He goes on to stomach cancer. It seems as though that's something where um, he treated people 20 years ago. They lived for a long time. Uh, a relative of his is still living. You do this uh, one teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda in one glass of water 30 minutes before breakfast and dinner for 15 days, then only in the morning for another 30 days, making sure that the patient assumes all the positions, prone, supine, and lateral, so that contact with the salts is achieved with all the mucus of the organs. It may sometimes happen that the double daily dosage caused diarrhea discharge but suspending the evening dose should be able to solve the problem. Generally, the blood in the feces disappears after five to 10 days. Digestion begins to normalize and the feeling of heaviness tends to regress with the result that the patient manages to gain weight. Everything is fairly simple, therefore, when the neoplasia, even of large dimensions, remains confined to the stomach wall and to some peripheral lymphenoids. In cases where there is a visible spreading on the adjunct structures, especially in the ligaments, st stomach cancer, as it, as it is impossible to reach completely, becomes extremely difficult to uproot. The colonies, in fact, are not um, touched by the bicarbonate in, administered in the stomach and work as a receptacle for a more marked proliferation where they cannot be attacked by the baking soda. They become the reference position for all the others, sustained in the fight for survival by those elements of biochemical solidarity that are at the basis of the formation and of the progression of the masses. So if anybody's ever seen that um, Chinese book, The Art of War, it seems as though if ever you needed uh, a handbook about the art of war, it seems to be uh, with cancer therapy. And of course, the best, the best is to have victory before war, is to avoid the war. But assuming that these tumors are already in the body, he's coming up with all the methods to get rid of them. So now he's explaining why if the cancer spreads beyond the stomach, why it's a little tricky, and how they're retreating and um, sort of regrouping in those corners of the body that uh, you're not able, even with the catheter, to reach where they are. Or, or, excuse me, we haven't come into the catheter yet. Here's why you need a catheter. And that's why it's so important to, uh, to have that license to use the catheter. And that's why the doctors who do have the licenses are so afraid to, uh, to lose them. Not that everybody wants to go out and actually heal cancer. He explains why that's not the case. But you can see why it's valuable to be able to use catheters. So now he's going to explain why you need them. To better understand this concept, one can imagine a great spider web formed by voluminous aggregates in the corners and elements of linear connection that join them and that work as communication means between the cells. When an element, an aggregation, or a great part of the structure is attacked, the alarm signals move from more exposed colonies to those which remain outside of the field of any toxic substance so that their defense reactions can be activated and increased without limitation. Furthermore, a displacement of nuclear elements from each cell towards a non-endangered location takes place through the porous cellular network, with the result that a greater concentration of noble reproductive structure can work undisturbed, even having the time to perform genetic changes as a function of the noxious agent. It is in this way that all forms of resistance to drugs and to other compounds, including bicarbonate, is developed. Even though when it comes to the latter, the adaptation is to be conceived in terms of resistance to the low dosage used in the therapy. The biological reactive network therefore explains the phenomenon of communication and defense between the aggregate cells and spores that are even quite distant from each other. 
It also explains the mechanism of the metasis, which are nothing but new fungin masses that have colonized an organ after departing and being fed by the mother colony. Assuming, however, that the spider web is widespread and that it touches many organs, one can ask why metastases are produced gradually, first in one organ and then in another, and so on. He goes on to say, the explanation consists in the fact that as long as a tissue has integrity and tone, that is, it is reactive, no fungin rooting is possible. When it weakens for a wide variety of causes and during the progression of the disease beyond a certain limit, it becomes more susceptible to attack, and thus it can be colonized. So you see, by using the word colonization, we get a real idea of exactly what cancer is. This is the reason why the main causes of metastasis are often the official therapies, as they produce such tissue suffering as to render these tissues defenseless to the fungi. Pretty interesting, huh? So there you go. Now what I'm going to do is flip you all over to the internet, where I'm going to see if... I'm going to show you why it's so important to have this cancer remedy that's easily accessible. And this is going to come in my inbox and show you what I got from one reader, one viewer. Um, Let me read this to you if uh, what would be the intention of making it I asked one of my viewers to make a video of his sister who has cancer and he's uh, giving me quite a plea and I knew this would happen for the hemp oil because it's very dramatic what Rick Simpson is talking about and I asked him to do that and he's going well you know like what use is that going to be and I'm trying to say it, it is going to be a use. What would be the intention for making it? Like an activism thing? Or to help me acquire the hemp oil? Because if you're thinking like for an activism thing to try and change the laws, my sister definitely, definitely doesn't have enough time for that. I just talked to my mom and she's not sure that she even has a month left. Were you thinking that Rick himself would somehow be able to help me acquire it? Uh, what I was asking in my first email was if you might be able to help me get a pound through the person you talked to who could get it for seven and a half thousand dollars, or maybe the Joe guy in your video, that wasn't Joe by the way, who said he knows someone who can get it for cheaper. If you wanted me to make the video for the purpose of proving that I really have a sister with cancer and that I'm who I say I am and not some sort of narc or something, I could probably do that. I could at least provide you with some proof, like pictures or something at least. I don't have a webcam, but I do have a digital camera, but I'm not sure if it records video or not. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. This is the reason why I think it's so important to tune in to Dr. T. Simoncini because he is talking about something that's easily uh, available and we don't have to risk um, you can get this on Amazon cancer is a fungus and here's his picture you can get this on Amazon.com and then see if you can uh, convince your doctor to, to use the therapies. See, cancerfungus.com. So there you go. I don't really want to get into, um, into the drug dealing stuff, but I'm very uh, sensitive to the fact that people are suffering because people are dying. And that's Jane Goldberg is going to come out on a book about that. That'll be so, you know, we've got a lot of alternatives here. We're here with Ted Rockwell, 
who has spent 60 years in nuclear technology, starting with the Manhattan Project, which was to build the atomic bomb, and you were stationed in Oak Ridge, Tennessee at the time. Right. And after that, Admiral Rickover hired you out of Oak Ridge to become the technical director of the Naval Reactor Program, uh, and that built the nuclear navy for the United States of America. Uh, you were there for 15 years, and then uh, President Dwight Eisenhower uh, decided that you should be part of the Atoms for Peace program. And in that program, you built the world's first atomic power station. This is who I'm speaking to today, Ted Rockwell. So, um, Ted, uh, I wanted to talk to you because I've gotten interested in the concept of radiation hermesis which is the application of low-level radiation. Uh, and contrary to how most people think about radiation, in fact, low-level radiation is not destructive. Seems to, over 3,000 medical studies have been conducted that seem to uh, document the idea that um, exposure to low-level radiation makes you live longer and healthier. And in this country now, most people seem to be quite terrified of anything using the word radiation, nuclear, atomic, um, especially after Nagasaki and Hiroshima. So you have different ideas about the meaning of radiation and nuclear and atomic, and I'd like to hear um, all about your experience and what you know about the phenomenon and, and what we can learn. Well, I find I've been talking to ordinary people about this for years, you know, whoever happens to be in the seat next to me at the airplane or whatever. And I find people don't have any difficulty understanding this. Uh, they understand it's like vaccination, it's like, uh, it's like uh, exercise, uh, red wine, all kinds of things that mm -hmm. are uh, potential attacks on an organism. And an organism responds uh, by souping up the, the uh, uh, defenses. So uh, your mother was right when she says uh, when you're going out, she doesn't say wipe off all the doorknobs uh, because there are germs on there. There are some people who have that phobia, but the normal healthy reaction is to say it's not the extra germ that's going to get you, it's whether or not your immune system is in good shape. So what she'll tell you is put on your galoshes and take care of yourself keep your immune system healthy because that's what's going to determine whether you're uh, in trouble or not. And I, I would just like to say parenthetically here, <clears throat> since my, I come out of the background of cancer, um, treatment of cancer patients and cancer research, and the pre ex-president of Sloan Kettering, that uh, bulwark of traditional medicine, Sloan Kettering, uh, Lewis Thomas, his theory of cancer was uh, that we're wasting a lot of money uh, trying to track down all of the various carcinogens in the environment because the environment is replete with carcinogens. We've created them. Um, but the key is that he, his theory about cancer is that we all have cancer in us all the time, cancer cells, and that if the immune system is in the right shape, then the immune system just naturally takes care of whatever kind of stray cancer cells happen to be lingering around. Yeah. And, and you're fine, and you never die so of cancer. So it's not the radiation that is uh, killing these germs. The radiation is stimulating the immune system, and the immune system then, which is very broad spectrum, that is, the immune system will go after anything that it perceives as a threat. And the other interesting point to know about this is that there is an actual black and white switch between the reaction of the body to low dose radiation and of high dose radiation. Different, uh, different genomes are, are uh, stimulated, different proteins are formed. There are two different processes, which is rather surprising, you know, but there are two different things that go on. And in the low dose radiation, you're, you're, putting, you're in initiating the type of response that is essentially error free. Uh, and when you're, and, and it's, it's a healing response. And if you get into the high dose radiation, then it's it's a uh, it's a survival mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's a much less effective uh, protection, but it's uh, you know they can pour more heat on and make that happen. 
And there's the reason that ordinary people can understand this and technical people have a problem with it is because you have to understand that scientists are not paid to solve problems. S scientists like lawyers and doctors are paid by the hour to work on problems. 